Good morning, this is Peter Combs from Bidamount.com and P.L. Combs Asian Antiques located in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And this is another part of a series of videos we're doing on Chinese porcelain. Uh, this one's about 15 minutes long or so and it's going to focus on blue and white and female June wear which are those yellow ground uh, pieces that you've seen around, done with enamels. First we're going to talk about blue and white. Blue and white porcelain was first introduced into China during the Yan Dynasty uh, by Muslim traders from the Middle East who had used cobalt for centuries. And the first piece up that we're going to look at is a rather nice Guangxu uh, dragon bowl we had uh, here a while ago. This is a large bowl, about 14 or 15 inches wide. It was beautifully done. Um, these pieces, uh, when done right, are very close to the quality that they saw during the Qinlung period. Uh, if you look carefully here at the details of the, of the dragon's head, it is minutely detailed in every way. The great shading of color, beautifully rendered, um, and a nice tonal quality to the blue, which is important. And when you turn this bowl over, this is the bottom you see, uh, or you saw. Uh, nicely done, very well done, Mark. Um, and uh, I've, as I've said in previous videos, fakes of Guangxu pieces are flooding the market. This is not a fake. This is a real one. And that's what the mark should look like. And the quality of the piece uh, should be more than uh, 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 enough to tell you whether or not a piece is authentic. All right. This is a mid-19th century food pot with copper handles and a detachable lid. There's a center section where you'd put uh, 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 hot coals or something cold to keep the food the right temperature. Um, and here you have uh, an old staple repair. It's a very old repair. It was done in bronze and uh, did it to preserve the piece. These are not uncommon to see on older pieces. Um, I think they're kind of charming. This is what the bottom of it looks like. It's your foot rim. Your very typical uh, white glazed base, but notice how neatly they uh, finish the feet on these. Um, very nice and uh, very collectible. This is a, a, a vase that on one side has a couple of rows of script. It's a poem about flowers and it's a Mei Ping vase done in the early to mid 19th century. Some people thought this was an 18th century vase. I don't think so. And there's the front of it. Um, beautifully done. There's a small flaw on the rim on the mouth. Um, but it's a, it's a nice example and very well painted with these flowers. And when you turn this vase over, this is the bottom you see. That's a very typical early 19th century foot. There's a little bit of glaze you can see on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, un the area where there's no white. Some of the glaze got on there and uh, coated it, made it a little shiny. Pretty typical. Here's a little uh, 19th century cobalt inkwell um, with uh, gilt on it. It's a four-sided piece, sort of a compressed Bombay form. And uh, when you turn this one over, it has a, an, a, a bogus Chin Lung mark on it. They, they use Chin Lung marks on a lot of stuff during the 19th century. So uh, it, it, as, as any of you who know, been around for a while, know that marks mean nothing most of the time. And here's a, a rather nice looking Kang Shi style uh, jar. It was an early 19th century one, but well painted, nicely done willow trees. The women are well articulated. It's a nice thing. And there's the foot again. Again, you see that slightly shiny area, a little bit of glaze or something got on the paste. And you see some iron oxide uh, uh, deposits are revealing themselves there uh, that pop out during the firing on these. It's a good indicator that it's a 19th century piece sometimes. And here's a nice little late uh, 19th century uh, jar with some figures around the outside and the rear heads. The, sorry, I didn't put the lid on a little more squarely for the picture. And there's the bottom of it. Um, these are, this is a pretty typical late 19th century piece. They sometimes try to peddle them as 18th century. They're not. These are 19th century. They made a lot of them. And here you have, this is a, a, a blue and, well, it's not really blue and white. It's a crackle glazed vase. If you've seen these crackle glazed pieces, they were all done pretty much... Uh, uh, after 1875 and uh, nicely painted, very uh, good detail and it's over this very popular crackle ground. This is a hat stand by the way. Uh, that's why it has these vent holes in it. You can put your hat on it and it'll dry out during the night. But I particularly liked this one. I sold it. It didn't sell for a lot of money. I thought it was a very charming example because I liked the way they took advantage of the holes to do the decoration around them. It's an interesting thing. 
Had, it did have a small hairline in the mouth though. Might have hurt the price. And that's the bottom. It has that dry, bronzed looking uh, uh, seal that they used. It was a dressing they applied to the paste to make it look almost like a bronze. And uh, they were very popular. They made lots of them during this time. Here's a bird feeder. Um, they bird, as you all know, uh, bird uh, uh, houses and uh, keeping uh, birds in cages was very popular in China. And they made beautiful little porcelain cups to, to feed the birds, the little bird seed. There's the, on the left is the wooden bracket that fit into the side of the cage. And on the bottom of this one, they, they added a little dragon for the fun of it. These were generally made in the second half of the 19th century. All right. Now here's another food pot. This one is underglazed blue, but it also has Dowsai enamels. And just as an aside, I bought this on eBay. Somebody was selling it as a Japanese uh, example and uh, sold it to me very reasonably. Uh, but it's a wonderful example, and it's sort of mid-19th century. Here's a detail of it. You can see the Dasai enamels mixed in there, along with the uh, cobalt blue and uh, a little bit of iron red uh, under the glaze. It's a nicely decorated uh, example, and uh, probably about eight inches tall. But well done, well done. When you flip this over, that's what the bottom of that looked like. Very typical also. Uh, slightly, nicely shaped foot. You see traces of kiln grit on the lower right there at about 5 o'clock. Uh, that's not unusual, and glazed right up into the center. And then, of course, no discussion of um, uh, Chinese blue and white would be complete uh, without talking about Canton and export wares. This is a pretty good uh, cross-selection of things that you'll see that were made between the uh, late 18th century, uh, a couple of pieces there actually, and into the very late 19th century. And here's a lar fairly large, uh, very uh, well uh, known and familiar uh, Fitzhugh, uh, 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 they call these spittoons sometimes, they have different names for them. There's the bottom of it. This one also made in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, nice, and, uh, nice and deeply glazed right up under the bottom and that sort of uh, slightly rustic foot, but not too bad. And here you have a pair of uh, little ginger jars. These are ubiquitous in the uh, Chinese art market. They're always very popular, um, often with what's known as a cracked ice pattern, like the one on the left, uh, especially. There it is, and with these uh, prunus blossoms, or apple blossoms coming up. And there's the bottom of it. That double, double ring does not mean it's Kangxi. It just means it has a double ring on it. So don't let that aid you in dating it anyway. But that's a 19th century one. And here you have a nice big pair. These were fairly tall. They were about uh, 15 inches tall. Slab constructed underglazed blue square vases um, with canted uh, shoulders. And there's the bottom of those. Again, you see a consistency uh, after a while, the way the feet uh, appear during the 19th century. Um, and that's a classic one. These, these were quite good uh, uh, as far as vases goes. And here's a little bulb tray. Probably early 19th century with those uh, character marks running around it. Um, they made these in sets. We've had sets of these, of vases and, and uh, bulb trays and cups. This is the underside of it. If you look uh, carefully, you'll see the spur marks, those little dots on the flat part of the bottom. There. There's a group of them on upper top, bottom right, and middle. Those were used to support the piece while it was being fired, keep it from sagging. And here's an underglazed blue and underglazed red um, uh, uh, ink pot. All right, nicely done. Uh, sort of midish 19th century. The wave border at the bottom, very well shaped. It has a nice shape to it. And uh, when you flip that over again, they added a dragon. They like adding dragons to the bottoms of small things. You'll find if you look around a lot. Um, and they continue to do them today. They add them to a lot of fakes, but that's what the bottom of a real one looks like. And again, pay attention to the foot rim and the tone of the blue. And last is this. This is, uh, they call these sixy type blue enamel grisaille bowls. It's not underglazed blue. It's not, it's overglazed blue, but it's, there, there's a picture of the base with all the spur marks. This is a very well-known type that was purportedly um, decorated. The decoration was uh, completed or, or, des or put together, designed by the Empress Dowager. And uh, I just thought I'd throw that in at the end. All right. They're fairly rare. Uh, now on to Famille June. These are generally categorized as pieces that are of a, a yellow enamel ground. The name was adopted by French Jesuits and sort of went into common usage during the 19th century to describe um, Chinese porcelain coloration. 
And here you have a classic pair, a Famille June, uh, done in the, very much in the Kangxi style on, uh, on a biscuit with a yellow, gla yellow enamel over it. There's no white glaze on these. This is the color uh, right, over the, right over the biscuit. Very beautifully painted. This was a large pair of vases. They were about 18 inches tall. Came out of a local estate we sold. The family had made them into lamps in the 1920s. But beautiful coloring, beautifully painted. And uh, were they to be of a different shape than this shape, uh, a lot of people would have been able to sell these as Kung Shi. I'm not so sure that someone didn't, because they, they brought a very large price when we sold them. On, I actually had these on eBay. But notice the detail, the facial expression of the man and the goat. And here's the bottom. Um, the unglazed paste on the bottom of these were as smooth as glass. They were very smooth, beautifully finished. You can also see the holes where the uh, grandparents had drilled this to be a lamp. Now here's another uh, Famille Ver, uh, Famille June Kung Shi style uh, vase. You'll find a lot of Famille June pieces were done in the Kung Shi style. But here's one. This is not a, a, a great example, but a typical example. The colors are a little harsh compared to the first one. Um, the decoration is a little bit mechanical. And this is a, a late piece, uh, but but uh, perfectly decorative, perfectly nice. You notice the, uh, the boy there doesn't have a much of a boyish look. He looks like a man dressed up as a child. The real ones, the boys look like little boys. They're out playing in the, in the, in the gardens, jumping in the vines. And here's a, a broader picture of the foot. Again, that brownish foot. You can see the knife cut marks, how, marks how they trimmed it. Um, very typical of the late 19th and even early 20th century. And here we have a Guangxu dragon plate. They made a lot of these. This was a popular pattern. They even made these in sets um, with the roundels of the, uh, of the dragons in the five places around it. And here's the back of it. The back of it was beautifully painted, though. The rim, the rim decoration was excellent, and the mark is perfectly well done. And this is a nice period example. And um, you see that, uh, you're, you, you have something. And here is a big second half of the 19th century planter. This thing was quite large, uh, I think uh, around 15 inches wide, but nicely painted. Very typical 19th century uh, decoration with those uh, turquoise lappets at the base with pink. And there's the bottom. Um, it was made originally with a drain hole in the bottom. Somebody, before we got it, plugged it. They probably uh, cracked or broke the saucer that went with it originally, and that's how they ended up. This is another example. This one with a big shao character on it, on a peach. And the peach, is a, as many of you know, is a symbol of uh, rebirth. It was popular during the Kangxi period, uh, Chen Lung period, rather. And here's a picture of the bottom of this one. Uh, there's this hairline there, but uh, the drain hole in the bottom is as it was made. This was not drilled later, and uh, nicely done. Now this was a very pretty pair of large dragon vases we had with ruffled rims. Um, they were around 24 inches tall, and just to, so you have an idea, if you see a pair of these while you're out there hunting around, they sold for about $24,000 or $22,000. Here's the dragon, uh, nicely decorated though in many colors, red tongue, green head, brown furry mane, and um, uh, so forth. And there's a picture of the ruffled mouth. It was, a, it was supposed to look like cloth. They did similar examples in Japan, too. So not all of them with ruffled mouths are uh, Chinese. The Japanese did them as well during this time. And there's a picture of the bottom of it, what you want to look for. You can see quite a bit of iron oxide fo uh, that formed during the firing in the upper left at about 11 o'clock on the foot on the outside. There's an old label in the middle. And here's a, a very late, maybe early 20th century pair of grisaille, uh, uh, ground decorated uh, va enamel vases, blue and uh, yellow enamel, and uh, with Famille Rose uh, flowers. And there's the foot on this. You can see where a little bit of the glaze, uh, the yellow glaze, actually got onto the unglazed part of the foot there, it runs around it. Not unusual to see. And you can see how they cut away. All right. And this, this plate sort of re relates back to that blue enamel uh, piece we showed on in the blue wares, the, the last piece. This is, uh, again, another one of these Empress Dowager Xixi plates. And uh, very typically done. The back of it, again, beautifully done. Here you see that nice, neat uh, grisaille decoration around the outside. Nicely shaped, a good glaze. These are very collectible, and um, they're pretty rare. 
Um, they they do bring thousands of dollars if you have one. All right, here's a clue coming up to a close up of the seal mark and the, and the rain mark, and it has it uh, it's the same one they use on all of them. Okay. And part of her inspiration for these were taken from these. This is this is probably a period one, a Jai Jing um, uh, plate with um, you know uh, all the creatures, the zodiological creatures all over it, the snake and the dragon and the goat and the ram and the cockerel. And there's the back, very nicely done, nice blue ground, well done seal mark right there in the middle. It's all hand painted. It's not impressed. These are all painted always. And we'll blow that up a little so you can get a better look. There it is. And that's 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 uh, that mark is spot on uh, for what you want to see on a Daijing um, uh, plate of not just uh, Femiel Jun but others. They use the red red mar red uh, enamel often. And here's a detail of the uh, dragon and the cockerel and part of the horse. Very attractively done. And uh, if you come across one of those, you should try to buy it. All right, now we're getting onto this is sort of getting toward the end. This is a, a brush pot that's part Femile June, part Femile Rose. They did mix it up a lot. Often you say, is it Femile June or is it Femile Rose? Or what is this? Well, sometimes they sort of mixed all the colors together, especially in the second half of the 19th century. They really experimented. And uh, here's a picture of the bottom. You see these squared applied foot mark on there. And it was scratched into the paste and then colored with ink. And that sort of wraps it up. Uh, all these pictures are things that we've sold over the years, uh, uh, many in the last few, and some going back much, much further. If you don't currently get our newsletter, um, go to bitamount.com and sign up for it. It's free. And uh, each week we send it out with uh, items that we found on eBay during the week that we think are worth looking at. We try to avoid the fakes as, uh, as much as we possibly can. We want people to buy the real thing. And uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this. And uh, until next time, uh, good luck out there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.